Hi. <laughs> so thank you for coming. I'm surprised. To, I didn't expect anybody to be here. It's Friday night and the Warriors are playing. And my whole way down, I was just trying to reassure myself that I would be okay if there was just like one guy here. So <laughs> thank you for coming. Um, so I don't know what you know about this novel, The Yiddish Policeman's Union, or what you might have heard about it, but um, it's a hard-boiled detective story. It's about a policeman named Meyer Lanzmann, who is a, a homicide detective in Sitka, Alaska. Uh, Sitka, Alaska is a small town of 9,000 people in, up in the panhandle of Alaska in our world, but in the world of this novel, it's a major metropolitan area of 2.5 uh, million people. Um, all of them, the descendants, or they themselves are um, immigrants, refugees from Hitler's Europe. Uh, in the world of this novel, an actual proposal to allow Jewish um, refugees to settle in Alaska that was pr put forward by Harold Ickes, the Secretary of the Interior, and in our world, obviously, came to nothing. In the world of this novel, it happened. I think that was Harold Ickes right there. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm just going to read you this part. Uh, uh, Meyer Lanzmann, the, the main character, has lives in a flop house, cheap hotel in downtown Sitka, and, and one of his fellow residents in this hotel is murdered in the very, just before the very first sentence of the novel. And he's investigating the murder, and in the course of the investigation, he goes to talk to one of his informants. So I'm going to read you most of the chapter where he talks to his best informant, Benito Taganis. And then I'm going to read you a little bit of the chapter that, that follows. And I'll read for about 20 minutes. And then I'd be happy to answer questions if anybody has any questions um, on any subject, dating and relationships, <laughs> recipes. I don't know anything about knitting, but I could bake it. Um, so, we're in another world, just bear that in mind. The Filipino-style Chinese donut, or shtekele, is a great contribution of the district of Sitka to the food lovers of the world. In its present form, it cannot be found in the Philippines. No Chinese trencherman would recognize it as the fruit of his native fry kettles. Like the storm god Yahweh of Sumeria, the shtekla was not invented by the Jews, but the world would sport neither God nor the shtekla without Jews and their desires. A panatella of fried dough, not quite sweet, not quite salty, rolled in sugar, crisp skinned, tender inside, and honeycombed with air pockets. You sink it in your paper cup of milky tea and close your eyes, and for 10 fat seconds, you seem to glimpse the possibility of finer things. The hidden master of the Filipino-style Chinese donut is Benito Tagales, proprietor and king of the bubbling vats at Mabuhe. Mabuhe, dark, cramped, invisible from the street, stays open all night long. It drains the bars and cafes after hours, concentrates the wicked and the guilty along its chipped formica counter, and thrums with the gossip of criminals, policemen, starkers and schlemiels, whores and night owls. With the fat applauding in the friars, the exhaust vans roaring and the boom box blasting the heart sick Kundimans of Benito's Manila childhood, the clientele makes free with their secrets. A golden mist of kosher oil hangs in the air and baffles the senses. Who could overhear with ears full of kosher fry and the wailing of Diomedes Macharan? But Benito Taganis overhears and he remembers. Benito could draw you a family tree for Alexei Lebed, the chieftain of the Russian mob, 
Only on it you would find not grandparents and nieces, but bagmen, bump offs, and offshore bank accounts. He could sing you a kundiman of wives who remain loyal to their imprisoned husbands and husbands doing time because their wives drop dimes on them. He knows who's keeping the head of furry Markov in his garage and which narcotics, narcotics inspector is on the payroll of Anatoly Moskowitz, the wild beast. Only nobody knows that he knows but Meyer Lanzmann. A donut, Reb Tagadis, Lanzmann says when he comes stomping in from the alley, shivering the crust of snow from his overshoes. The Sitka Saturday afternoon lies dead as a failed messiah in its winding rag of snow. There was nobody on the sidewalk, hardly a car in the street, but here inside Mabuhe Donuts, three or four floaters, solitaries and drunks between benders, lean against the sparkly resin counter sucking the tea from their shtekalas and working the calculations of their next big mistakes. Only one, Benito says. He is a squat, thick man with skin the color of the milky tea he serves, his cheeks pitted like a pair of dark moons. Though his hair is black, he's past 70. As a young man, he was the flyweight champion of Luzon, and with his thick fingers and the tattooed salamis of his forearms, he gets taken for a tough customer, which serves the needs of his business. His big caramel eyes betray him, so he keeps them hooded and downcast. But Lotsman has looked into them. To run a stinker, that's an informant, you have to see the broken heart inside the deadest pan. Look like you should to eat a couple, maybe three, detective. Benito elbows aside the nephew or cousin he's got working the fry basket and snake charms a rope of raw dough into the fat. A few minutes later, Lotsman is holding a tight paper packet of heaven in his hand. I uh, have that information you wanted on Olivia's sister's daughter, Lotsman says, around a warm, sugary mouthful. Benito draws a cup of tea for Lanzman and then nods toward the alley. He pulls on his anorak and they go out. Benito takes a ring of keys from his belt loop and works open an iron door two doors down from Mabuhe Donuts. This is where Benito keeps his lover, Olivia, in three small, tidy rooms with a Warhol portrait of Dietrich and a bitter smell of vitamins and rotten gardenia. Olivia is not there. The lady has been in and out of the hospital lately, dying in chapters, with a cliffhanger at the end of every one. Benito waves Lanzmann into a red leather armchair piped in white. Of course, Lanzmann has no information for Benito about any of Olivia's sister's daughters. Olivia is not really a lady either, but Lanzmann is also the only one who knows that about Benito Taganis, the donut king. Years ago, a serial rapist named Cone forced himself on Miss Olivia Lagdameo and found out her secret. Cone's second big surprise that night was the chance appearance of Patrolman Lanzman. What Lanzman did to Cone's face left the Mamzer talking with a slur for the rest of his life. So it's a mixture of gratitude and shame, and not money that drives the flow of information from Benito to the man who saved Olivia. Ever hear anything about the son of Heskel Spillman? Lanzmann says this is, that's the dead man. Setting down the donuts and the cup of tea. Kid named Mendel? Benito stands, hands clasped behind his back like a boy called on to recite a poem at school. Over the years, he says, a thing or two. Junkie, no? Lanzmann arcs one fuzzy eyebrow a quarter of an inch. You don't answer a stinker's questions, especially not the rhetorical ones. Mendel Spillman, Benito decides. Seen him around maybe a few times. Funny guy. Talk a little Tagalog. Sing a little Filipino song. What happened? He not dead? He not dead. Still, Lanzmann doesn't say anything. But he likes Benito Tagalog. 
and running him always feels a little rude. To cover the silence, he picks up the shtekela and takes a bite. It's still warm, and there's a hint of vanilla, and the crust crunches between his teeth like a caramel glaze. And the crust crunches between his teeth like a caramel glaze on a pot of custard. As it goes in the lanceman's mouth, Benino watches with the appraising coldness of an orchestra conductor auditioning a flutist. That's good, Benny. Don't insult me, detective, I beg you. Sorry. I know it's good. The best, Lanzmann says. Nothing in your life even comes close, Benito says. This is so easily true that the sentiment brings a sting of tears to Lanzmann's eyes, and to cover that, he eats another donut. Somebody was looking for the Yid, Benito says in his rough and fluent Yiddish. Two or three months back, a couple somebodies. You saw them? Benito shrugs. His tactics and operations, he keeps a mystery from Lanzmann. The cousins and nephews and the network of sub-stinkers he employs. Somebody saw them, he says. Might have been me. Were they black hats? Benito considers the question for a long moment, and Lanzmann can see it troubles him in a way that's somehow scientific, almost pleasurable. He gives his head a slow, certain shake. No black hat, he says, but beards. Beards? You mean, what, they were religious types? Little yarmulkes, meat beards, young men. Russians? Accents? If I heard about these young men, then he says, then the one who told me didn't say nothing about accents. If I saw them myself, then I'm sorry, I don't remember. Hey, what's the matter? What for you don't write this down, detective? Early on in their collaboration, Lanzmann made a show of taking Benito's information very seriously. Now he fishes out his notebook and scratches a line or two just to keep the Donut King happy. He's not sure what to make of them, these two or three neat young Jews, religious but not black hat, who came looking for Mendel Spillman. Uh, what were they asking about exactly, please, he says. Whereabouts? Information? Did they get it? Not at, ben not at Mabuhe Donut, not from a Taganis. Benito's cell phone rings and he snaps it open and lays it against his ear. All the hardness goes out of the lines around his mouth. His face matches his eyes now, soft, brimming with feeling. He rattles on tenderly in Tagalog. Lanzmann catches the lowing sound of his own last name. How is Olivia? Lanzmann asks as Benito closes his phone and ladles a yard of cold plaster into the mold of his face. She can't eat, Benito says. No more shtekalas. That's a shame. They're through. Lanzmann gets up, slips the note back, notebook back into his hip pocket and feeds himself the last bite. He feels stronger and happier than he has in weeks or perhaps months. There's something in the death of Mendel Spillman, a story to grab hold of, and it's shaking the dust and spiders off him. Or else, it's the donut. They head for the door, but Benito puts a hand on Lanzmann's arm. Why don't you ask me anything else, detective? What would you like me to ask you? Lanzmann frowns, then lights doubtfully on a question. You heard something today? Something else? It's hard to imagine. That he would have. No, I asked another thing. You still looking for that Zilberblatt? Victor Zilberblatt is one of the 11 outstanding cases that Lanzmann and his partner still have on their docket. Zilberblatt was stabbed to death last March outside of the Hofbrau Tavern in the old German quarter a few blocks from here. The knife was small and dull, and the murder had an unstudied air. Somebody see the brother, Benito says, Rafi, sneaking around. Nobody was sorry to see Victor go, least of all his brother, Raphael. Victor had abused Raphael, cheated him, humiliated him, and made free with his cash and his woman. After Victor died, Raphael left town, whereabouts unknown. The evidence linking Raphael to the knife is inconclusive at best. Two semi-reliable witnesses put him 40 miles away from the German quarter for two hours on either side of the likely time of his brother's murder. But Rafi Zilberblatt 
has a long and monotonous police record, and he will do very nicely, Monsman reflects. Sneaking where, Monsman says. The information is like a hot black mouthful of coffee. He can feel himself coiling around Raphael Zilberblatt's freedom like a hundred pound snake. That big mocker store, Benito says, is gone now up at Granite Creek. Somebody see him sneaking in and out of there, carrying things. A can of propane. Maybe he living inside the empty store. Thanks, Benny, Watsman says. I'll check it out. Just a little more. Now, all of, we all know that the first thing you're supposed to do if you're a policeman and you're in the situation Lanceman's in now is call for backup. But he forgets. Lanceman straps an extra clip to his belt and drives out to the north end, past Halibut Point, where the city sputters and the water reaches across the land like the arm of a policeman. Just off the Ickes Highway, the wreck of a shopping center marks the end of the dream of Jewish Sitka. The push to fill every space from here to Jacobi with the Jews of the world gave out in this parking lot. There was no permanent status granted to the Jews here, no influx of new Jew flesh from the bitter corners and dark alleys of diaspora. The planned housing developments remain lines on blue paper encumbering some steel drawer somewhere. The Granite Creek Big Mocker outlet died about two years ago. Its doors are chained, and along its windowless flank where Yiddish and Roman characters once spelled out the name of the store, there's only a cryptic series of holes, domino pips, a braille of failure. Lanceman leaves his car at the median and hikes across the giant frozen blank of the parking lot toward the front door. The snow is not as deep here as in the streets of the central city. The sky is high and pale gray with darker gray tiger stripes. Lanceman huffs through his nostrils as he marches toward the glass doors, their handles pinioned like arms with a dangling length of blue rubberized chain. Lanceman has this idea that he's going to knock on those doors with his shield held high and his attitude vibrating like a force field and that slinking whippet of a man, Rafi Zilberblatt, is going to step, sheepish and blinking, into the snow-dazzling day. The first bullet blackens the air alongside Lanceman's right ear like a fat humming fly. He doesn't even know it's a bullet until he hears or remembers hearing a muffled burst and then a clamor of the glass. By then, he's falling on his belly in the snow, flattening himself on the ground where the next bullet finds the back of his head and burns it like a trail of gasoline touched by a match. Lanceman drags out his sholem, that's his gun, but there's a cobweb in his head or over his face and a paralysis of regret afflicts him. His plan was no plan at all, and now it has gone bad. He has no backup. Nobody knows where he is but Benito Taganis, with his molasses gaze and his all but universal silence. Lanceman is going to die in a desolate parking lot at the margin of the world. He closes his eyes, he opens them, and the cobweb is denser and sparkling with some kind of dew. Footsteps in the snow, more than one person. Lanceman raises his gun and takes aim through the sparkling strands of whatever is going wrong in his brain. He fires. There's a cry of pain, feminine, a woof of breath, and then the lady wishes a cancer upon Lanceman's testicles. Snow packs Lanceman's ears and melts into the collar of his coat and down his neck. Somebody snatches at Lanceman's gun and tries to drag him to his feet. Popcorn on the breath. The bandage over Lanceman's eyes stretches thin as he lurches upright. He can see the mustachioed snout of Rappy Zilberblatt, and by the doors of the big mocker store a plump bottle blonde lying on her back, her life pumping from her belly into the steaming red snow. And a couple of guns, one of them in Zilberblatt's hand, pointed at Lanceman's head. At the glint of the automatic, 
the cobweb of Lanzmann's regrets and self-recriminations goes away. The smell of popcorn coming from inside the abandoned store alters his perception of the smell of blood and brings out the sweetness of it. Lanzmann ducks and lets go of his Smith & Wesson. Zilberblatt was yanking so hard on the gun that when Lanzmann unclenches, the other man goes tumbling backward into the snow. Lanzmann scrambles on top of Zilberblatt. He's just acting now without a thought in his head. He yanks his sholem loose and turns it around and the world pulls the trigger on all its guns. Zilberblatt grows a horn of blood from the crown of his head. The cobwebs are now in Lanzmann's ears. He can hear only the breath at the back of his throat and his own blood pulsing. For an instant, a strange peace opens like an umbrella inside Lanzmann as he straddles the man he just killed, knees burning in the snow. He retains a presence of mind to recognize that this tranquility is not necessarily a good sign. Then the doubts begin to crowd in around the knowledge of the mess he has made, bystanders gathering around a suicide leaper. Lanzmann staggers to his feet. He sees the gore on his coat, the tatters of brain, a tooth. Two dead humans in the snow. The smell of popcorn, a buttery stink of feet overwhelms him. While he is busy heaving up his guts into the snow, another man wanders out of the big mocker store. A young man with a rat snout and a loping gait. Lanzmann retains the wit to mark him as a Zilberblatt. This Zilberblatt has his arms raised and a wild look on his face, but his hands are empty. When he sees Lanzmann bleeding and sick on all fours, he abandons his project of surrender. He picks up the automatic lying on the ground by the ruin of his brother. Lanzmann careens to his feet and the trail of fire at the back of his head flares up. He feels the ground give way and then there is a roaring blackness. After he dies, he wakes up lying face down in the snow. He can't feel snow on his cheek. The wild ringing in his ears is gone. He humps himself up to a sitting position. The blood from the back of his head has scattered rhododendrons in the snow. The man and the woman he shot have not moved, but there is no sign of the young Zilberblatt who did or did not shoot and kill him. With a sudden clarity of thought and a mounting suspicion that he has forgotten to die, Lanzmann pats himself down. His watch wallet, car keys, cell phone. His watch, wallet, car keys, cell phone, gun, and badge are gone. He looks for his car parked in the distance along the frontage road. When he sees that his Chevelle Supersport is gone, he knows that he is still alive because only life could offer such a bitter vista. <laughs> Another fucking Zilberblatt, he says. <laughs> and they're all like that. He's cold. He considers entering the big mocker, but the stench of popcorn keeps him away. He turns from the yawning doors and lifts his eyes toward the high hill and beyond it, the mountains, black with trees. Then he sits down in the snow. After a while, he lies down. It's snug and comfortable, and there's a smell of cool dust, and he closes his eyes and falls asleep, folded up into his nice little dark bed in the uh, hole in the bed, sorry, bed in the hole in the wall of the Hotel Zamenhof. And for once in his life, his claustrophobia doesn't trouble him, not a bit.